Well, good morning, everybody, and uh, my heartfelt greetings to all those who are watching us from Cranbourne, East Peran, and the Pakenham churches, as well as our small broadcasting team here. Unfortunately, for a few weeks, you'll have to tolerate us, and because we're the only ones who are allowed to come and talk to you. Uh, but I'll do my best so that we have a variety of topics uh, to cover and uh, a lot of things to discuss. Well, do, do you know what drug was called the number one narcotic in the world in 1975 when the World Health Organization held its 28th session? Let me repeat this. When the World Health Organization held its 28th session, they named a narcotic, a drug, as the number one drug in the world. What was that drug all about, and how does it relate to you and me? We are going to talk about this next week. Next Sabbath, we'll talk about the world's most dangerous drug. And we'll see the Bible perspectives on this drug and how it may affect you and me. But today we will finish our reading of Matthew chapter 7. I think it was Steve Stosich who gave me the home task of preparing a presentation on Matthew 7. And last week we talked about the crescendo of the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, we discussed uh, this great declaration of the principles of God's kingdom on earth and in heaven. And uh, Jesus expressed his character, uh, his attitude, his passion uh, through the Sermon on the Mount. And the full uh, transcript of the sermon you will find in uh, the Gospel of Luke chapter 12 uh, and also Matthew 5, 6 and 7. But uh, before I discuss this, let me uh, give you a couple illustrations which I believe will help us better understand the content of this presentation. I and my family migrated to Australia 12 years ago. Uh, four years uh, after migration, we became Australian citizens, and we really feel ourselves part of this country. This is our home. And I still remember the first winter in Australia and the first surprises. First of all, I grew up in the Ural Mountains with Siberian climate. And I still remember my childhood when schools would close when it was 35 degrees below zero. And uh, sometimes the temperatures would plummet to 44, 45 degrees below zero. It would be very cold. And I and other kids, when the schools are closed, we would go out and play. Uh, we go skiing, skating. Even it was when it was 40 below zero, we really enjoyed it. But why was that? Well, the reason was very simple. We always returned to very warm homes because uh, inside those big apartment buildings with thick brick walls or thick panel walls, uh, the temperature was roughly 23, 24 degrees inside. So it was nice, comfortable, and warm. When the temperatures would rise to uh, internally to 25, 26 degrees, we would open the windows when outside it's 40 below, but inside it's 26. So we had to drop our temperatures and uh, create an airflow. So we uh, moved to Australia in the middle of a very hot summer, and we're thinking, well, this is what Australia is all about, the country which enjoys its warmth, uh, which is so nice and wonderful. But all our pleasures started to be questioned when we hit the Australian winter. And we realized that we, at that time, we were renting a house from Avondale College, which was a little over 100 years old. Our sister Ellen White, who at that time lived in Avondale, probably walked through that road many times, and she probably saw the walls of this house. And I still remember the winter is there. The temperatures drop down, so say, five, seven degrees above zero. At night, two, three degrees. And inside the house, it's freezingly cold. You have, uh, then we learned the Australian expression, to rug 
up. All right? You have to rug up. And you have to sleep almost under a ton of blankets to survive those freezing cold nights. Of course, you may use heaters, and then, wow, the energy bills come, and you see how expensive it is. Then we moved to another house, which was also on the same, uh, in the same area. The house, which was roughly 70 years of age. And, uh, uh, and in winter time, the next winter, I started noticing that behind uh, the pieces of furniture, there was mold. And for me, uh, that was a shock because I've never seen mold inside a house in my whole life. And uh, then I realized when I looked underneath the house, the house was sitting, it was an old style house, it was sitting on poles, all right, on posts, and uh, underneath there was just soil. And the soil was, of, uh, especially when it rains, was often damp, and that dampness was rising to the house. And I had to go to Coles, and for the first time in my life, buy the anti-mold spray. I had to uh, spray the walls, pieces of furniture, inside and out, and wipe the mold away. Uh, of course, we uh, had all sorts of things done. We uh, had uh, diggers come who to drain uh, excess water. We tried to fight this as much as we could, but... Uh, after that, uh, we lived there for about three years. We realized that we would never be able to overcome the issue of mold in an old house with no, no proper foundation. And it, it was only when we built our first house in Kurenbong, uh, and uh, I, when I saw how they do that, when my heart was finally at ease. Uh, they first pour a concrete slab. A concrete slab is very good on one hand because it provides a very strong foundation on the house. On the other hand, it prevents moisture from going up into the walls and inside the house from, uh, uh, from soil. A good foundation provides a good and healthy Australian house because that's when you don't have mold. That's when uh, your house is much warmer in winter, though in, in spite of all those efforts, I still believe even newer homes in Australia are very cold in winter. Uh, I think I wish they would uh, make the walls wider and the insulation also wider, and we would uh, have a much warmer homes than what we have today. Our homes today are not that warm. Probably an old English custom. You have to have some extremes in life. But uh, when you look at uh, a healthy home and a sick home, a sick home has a lot of mold, a healthy home has no mold. Another illustration. Let's travel back to the days of Jesus. In the days of Jesus, Israel lived in uh, a strip of land uh, which was uh, fertile during the season of rain and barren and deserted during the dry season. In fact, they had two seasons, the early rain and the later rain, and uh, when uh, there was abundance of everything, when they grew harvest, when they enjoyed a good life, but in the middle there was this dry season when everything was just yellow and red. Uh, if you travel to the Judean desert, that's where you have the city of Jericho, and that's where you can see the great Jordan River, you will see uh, this barren, lonely, rocky desert with scattered herds of sheep here and there, even today. And Jesus, when he was talking to the crowd on the Sermon on the Mount... He used an illustration of a house which was either built on sand or on a rock. Well, we know that in Israel there's a lot of rock because there's a lot of mountains. It's a very mountainous terrain with some uh, valleys in between, like the Valley of Megiddo, the famous valley of the Armageddon battle. Uh, and uh, uh, but generally speaking, generally speaking, Israel has a lot of rock, so it's very difficult to actually plow soil. Uh, in fact, in ancient times, when you read the words of Jesus about a sower who was sowing seed, he said some seed fell on fertile soil, some seed fell on the rock, and some seed fell uh, in a place where you had a lot of weeds, and uh, some seed fell at uh, the road uh, where the uh, birds just uh, ate the seed. Uh, Jesus, when he was referring to that method of agriculture, emphasized the fact that there was very little plowing. 
Because if you plow your soil, all your soil is very good. Uh, but in Israel, it was impossible to plow the soil because of an abundance of rocky soil. But because there were those seasons of early and later rain, and there was less plowing, and people would just throw a seed, and it would still bring a harvest. So Jesus says, if you build your house on a rock, it'll stand. If you build your house on sand, it'll be washed away during the rain season. And the rain season is of Israel in Israel can be very cruel when you have streams of water just flooding the area. So Jesus in ancient times said, if you want a good house, build it on the rock. Just like in modern Australia, if you want a healthy, healthy mold-free house, uh, build it on a good foundation. Prevent uh, the moisture from rising into your house. And in the days of Jesus, this was an issue of survival. If you really want to survive a flood, build your house on the rock. So we'll come back to this illustration a little bit later. But now let's go to the text and read Matthew 7. And we'll start with verse 21. Matthew 7, verse 21. And everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father in heaven, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, uh, or, cast, or cast demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from ye, from me, you who practice lawlessness. So Jesus says, not everybody who professes to know God not every person who declares himself a believer will enter the kingdom of heaven. And then Jesus says that in the last days, at the last judgment, many people will tell him, Lord, but we've done many wonders in your name. We even prophesied in your name. And Jesus says, depart from me, all you who do lawlessness. And lawlessness, or the Greek word anomia, literally mean, means those who break my law. If you read the book of Revelation, and especially those chapters which focus on the last day's events, uh, the book of Revelation makes it very clear that the last battle in the history of mankind will be about the law of God. The law which consists of ten commandments. You remember uh, the great trumpets, and when the seventh trumpet sounds... Uh, John looks up in heaven, and the sanctuary is open, and, there, and there's no veil between the holy and the unholy. He looks straight into the holy of holies, and right there he sees the Ark of the Covenant. Why is it that when the seventh trumpet sounds, which is the context of the end of time, because the first six trumpets sound earlier, and the seventh trumpet signifies the grand finale at the end of time, and right there, at the grand finale, at the grand final, you see the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark which contains the covenant inside, which contains the great Ten Commandments. Revelation 14, when the angel, in the first angel's message, invites all of humans on earth to worship God and give him glory, declaring the hour of God's judgment, he says, worship him who worship the one, uh, uh, worship him uh, who uh, created the heavens, the earth, the sea, and what is in them. And that's the language of the fourth commandment. So the fourth commandment uh, is right in the heart of the book of Revelation, spoken of indirectly, but the language is there. So the book of Revelation is there for us to look for parallels and echoes and allegories uh, and other passages uh, from the Old Testament, which then explains the meaning of the book of Revelation. So the law of God and the fourth commandment, which talks about the Sabbath, are right there in the heart of the last day's conflict. It's not COVID-19, my friends. It's the law of God and the Holy Sabbath of God. They are mentioned in the Bible in the context of the last days. And when Jesus talks about the judgment day on the Sermon on the Mount, he says that people who will not be able to break into or enter or walk into the kingdom of God are the ones who break God's law. So this is a very 
serious matter. Because nowadays, Christianity globally is rolling in the same direction as Christianity in the days of Constantine the Great. You remember, Christians, after 200 years of persecution in the 2nd and the 3rd century by multiple Roman emperors, when finally there was an easing of restrictions, we're using the modern COVID term, uh, by Emperor Constantine, Christians thought, well, this is the, our silver bullet, this is the golden time for us to win the Roman Empire to Christ. But to win the Roman Empire for Christ, the first things that Christians did, they allowed the commandments of God be changed and deviated from. The law of God was broken. The law of God was tampered with. And later, in some catechisms, the medieval church would even delete some of the commandments which would directly oppose the abuse of Christian teaching, the abuse of biblical teaching in Christian history. And nowadays we see a similar picture globally. And Christianity is desperate because we are fighting not against an outside persecution. Uh, at the moment it's not the biggest issue. Yes, there is persecution in countries like North Korea and some others and China. But generally speaking, our biggest problem is not persecution, especially here in Australia. We're dealing with secularism. We are dealing with the secularization of human society and the mindset is changing. People are becoming what we call non-religious when people say, well, I'm not interested. It's not, it's not my business. And that, uh, and that is the global trend. You see it in America, Great Britain, Australia, France, everywhere. And so we are dealing with secularism, which is sweeping over us. And we're thinking, well, what can we do to win the secular people for Christ? And then we think, well, it's time for us to look like the world so the world will join us. My friend, we are repeating the same mistake that happened 1700 years ago in the days of Constantine the Great. And often we are ready to take the commandments of God and put them behind us so that we don't look bad in the eyes of the world. Many years ago, when I was at uh, what they call a minister's fraternal, it was a meeting between the pastors and ministers of various churches. And there was a Baptist pastor, a couple of charismatic pastors, Pentecostals, Adventists. And we had a wonderful time because we were all friends. We had those meetings together and we actually did a lot of evangelistic projects together. That was back in Russia when I was working in the Volga Conference as president. And I still remember the Baptist pastor at one of our meetings he made a speech and said, I would like to tell all of us that Seventh-day Adventist Christians are not only our brothers and sisters, but they preach the true gospel of Jesus because they still preach the law of Ten Commandments. And when uh, the stunned uh, audience looked at him, because as you know, in many churches, they would very, very, very seldom even mention Ten Commandments. He said, well, because they preach the Ten Commandments, then they show the true nature of sin. And when you see the true nature of sin, then you can have uh, see the true nature of the cross and the grace of God. Because without the law of God, you can't identify the problem. You can't really tell the sinner that he is a sinner who deserves death. But if you identify a problem, then you can take that problem to the cross. Then you can take that sinner with a penitent heart to the foot of the cross to repent and find forgiveness of sins. So the gospel is essential because it, it is a mirror that shows your and mine sinfulness and takes us all to the foot of the cross to find salvation in Jesus, his grace, his love, his forgiveness. And Jesus says, not everybody who tells me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Because many today profess the name of, Christian, uh, uh, name of Christ around the world. But how many are trying to hide the truth from the people to make themselves look popular? or even earn some money. We know that around the world, uh, and you've seen them on television, like TBN, the great prosperity gospel preachers, the ones who tell you, well, if you invest in us, God will invest in you, and you'll become wealthy and rich. All your debts will be gone. Uh, wealth is a symbol of God's blessing. And uh, many of them preach it openly. When you're poor, well, it means that your faith is not enough. And if you're in poverty, well... It means that God is not there with you, my friends. God never promised us wealth in the Bible. God promised that he will take care of our needs. David says, I've been young and I've grown old, but I've never seen a righteous man 
hungry and his children begging for bread. God will provide for us. And many will get wealth because there are some people whom God will bestow wealth with, but God is not going to give wealth to everyone. What we need to do is to stay faithful to Christ in poverty and in wealth, in good times and in bad times, in health and in the COVID-19 era. Stick to Christ, my friends. Let's continue. Here we find the words of Jesus in verse 24. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken them to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat up that house, and it fell. And great way and great was its fall. And so it was when Jesus had ended these things that the people were astonished at his teachings. So he taught, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. So here you find something special about Jesus in these words. The people saw that there was a difference between what Jesus was saying and the wise men were saying. My friends, there is a lot of wisdom in the world. There is a lot of knowledge in the, in the world. In fact, in the last 30 years, mankind accumulated more knowledge than in all of our history since the days of Adam and Eve. Uh, you go to Google, you go to the Internet, it's the world's biggest storage of information. The biggest encyclopedia in the world is not Encyclopedia Britannica, it's Wikipedia. And uh, you are in the English language, you are approaching more than 2 million articles. Even if you were, if you were to read just the names of uh, those articles, it would take you roughly 180 years just to read the names of those articles without even reading them. It would take you thousands of years to read just the Wikipedia encyclopedia. I'm not talking about Google and all the information that you and I and the billions in the world uh, have today. In fact, I'm lo really looking forward to living in eternity because at that time I'll be able to read all the books because I, I'll have an unlimited life. Everlasting life, no end. And I can read whatever I want because my life will never end. And that's when you can read Wikipedia from A to Z in, a, in say, a thousand years and then turn to another encyclopedia from another galaxy. But we have a lot of knowledge. And there are many people in this world who are like the scribes of old who claim to have a lot of knowledge, who think they know better. But there is a difference between the knowledge of this world and what Jesus says. Jesus was different. He had this supernatural authority, which made a difference, where people immediately saw that what, was, what, that what was, uh, he was saying was different to what humans were saying. His authority was the authority of God incarnate. God came to this world in human flesh and taught us how much he loves us. The words of Jesus were simple, plain and clear, and at the same time they were filled with compassion, care and passion, with supernatural angelic charisma, with power and dynamics of the great Messiah. Jesus was so wonderful, so attractive, so awesome, the best, the most amazing, the most awesome man who ever lived, who was so wonderful, so charming, so undescribable, Jesus is there. And he said, well, whoever listens to what I'm saying and does what I, do, what I teach, you will be like a person who built his house on the rock. You will be a, like a person who built his house and there is no mold issue. But if you don't, if you just read 
but you never put my teachings to practice. You're like a person who is building his or her house on sand or whose house is full of mold and every week you have to walk around with a spray or any other substance wiping that harmful mold from the walls and your furniture. My friends, we are coming to a very special period in Earth's history. And September 11, and by the way, today, uh, uh, maybe coincidental or even providential that Dioga and I are the only ones who are allowed to talk to you uh, from this pulpit, but both of us are married to, a ver to very charming ladies uh, with uh, the September 11 birthday. And uh, today, when I and Paul return back home, we're going to have, ah, I'm just looking forward, forward to that beautiful birthday meal which we're going to have as a family. Unfortunately, we can't even have anyone visit us because there's still restrictions on that. But September 11 attacks, the global problem of terrorism, COVID-19 pandemic, all sorts of crises, the resurgence of the Cold War, all of these things are telling us that, yes, you and I are living in the last period of Earth's history. And we all are witnesses that the gospel is still being preached in spite of all the borders being shut. Through the internet, millions of people are still learning about God's love. And uh, we know that during these times, your faith and my faith is going to be put to a test. Is your faith, is your conviction in Jesus built on the rock, my friend? Or is it on sand? Well, let me give you just a few hints. If you try to avoid the Bible in your life or forget to read about uh, read it and study the Bible, well, my friend, you are building on sand. You are building on the news. You are building on YouTube. You are building on social media. You are building on fantasy stories, detective fairy tales, but not on the truth. So, my friend, make the Bible reading your daily routine, your daily practice. Even if you spend 15 minutes a day reading the Bible, it's only 196th of one day, which is little more than 1% of one day. And I think God, the omnipotent, the omnipotent God, the great Father in heaven, He is worthy of having 1% of your time. Read the Bible every day. My friend, look at Daniel, Daniel chapter 6. How many times a day do you pause to talk to God? Daniel, you remember, in spite of the decree of King Darius that uh, anyone who prays to, uh, to anyone, uh, to a different God, will be sentenced to death, Daniel still continued to pray three times a day, opening his windows, looking towards Jerusalem, praying in the morning, praying in the afternoon, praying in the evening. My friend, what about prayer? How often do you talk to God? Or maybe you have spoken to God for the last time 20 years ago. Maybe you're coming to church only because your family is here and it's part of your culture. But do you actually have a personal relationship with Jesus? What role does Jesus play in your life? What place does he have in your daily routine? God is not requiring you to give him everything. When he gives us, ev uh, gives us income, and when he gives us ability to live and enjoy a material life, he says, out of all things that are in this world, you return to me only 10%. God is never asking you for 90. The, the biblical element of tithe shows that God respects our autonomy, and he says, well, I want you to live an autonomous life. You have a family, you have a life. You just bring back to me one-tenth one tenth or whatever I give you. When uh, the Bible talks about time, Jesus says, I don't want you to give me everything and all your time. Just give me one-seventh. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath to the Lord your God. And uh, on a daily basis, just looking at uh, the story of biblical heroes, patriarchs, prophets, the apostles, spend time with God, praying and reading the Bible. You don't need a lot to have your faith 
strong and grounded on a rock. My friends, is it going to be easier tomorrow? Well, I don't think so. Is pandemic going to be easier? I don't think so. How will you be able to survive all the stresses of the surging cases, packed hospitals, life in and out of lockdown, global conflicts, potential wars? How are you going to survive that? Already, in our happy Australia, there is a lot of suicide. There are millions of people on the brink of an emotional collapse. Many countries in the world, including us, are rolling towards bankruptcy and the historical disaster, economic disaster. How will you be able to survive that, my friend? And what if, on top of all of these things, your faith is put to a test and you have to choose whether you will stand firm for the truth of the Bible or you'll give it in for the image or the visibility of security and safety. My friend, if you really want to survive the pandemic, the stresses of lockdowns, if you really want to survive all the crises which will only multiply because the Bible says the, that Satan came down to this planet in great wrath knowing that he has only little time left. And how will you survive the great tribulation at the end of time, just before Jesus comes? A lot of hardships are facing us, my friends. But you will be able to survive everything with ease, with peace of mind, with strength and power, if you have Christ in your life and if your faith is built on a rock. The one who believes in Christ will have peace inside and troubles outside. That's my choice, my friend. I don't want you to have troubles inside or peace outside or even troubles inside and troubles outside, which is even worse. I want you, my friend, to have peace inside. Build on Christ. Build on the rock. And you will come out of all these turmoils triumphant, victorious. And just imagine a wonderful day when it's all going to be over. I'm not talking about the lockdowns being over when it will give us just a temporary social relief. And I'm passionate to get back to a swimming pool and swim. I'm desperate to see this church full of people. I want to embrace little kids and tell them how much I love them in the kids' Sabbath school. I'm waiting for that wonderful time. But that's only a temporary relief for the time being. The greatest relief is when you and I are on the, side of, on the other side of the Red Sea, on the other side of the River Jordan, in the promised land, in the kingdom of God. I'm looking forward to that day. And I invite you, my friend, to be there with Jesus. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, I am praying for my precious and visible audience. Please enter our lives and hearts. Make our faith firm, built on a rock. In the wonderful name of Jesus, amen. Well, my dear friends, I'll see you next week by God's grace. And thank you for watching today.